I didn't mind telling you how old I am, but uh, I was born in Reedsville, North Carolina, which is a big city north of here. <laughs> what years did you teach at J.C. Price School? Uh, I was at J.C. Price School as a teacher from, I think it was 1958 or 59 until, let's see, I think it was about probably 1959. What subjects did you teach at J.C. Price? Social studies. Uh, I taught social studies and uh, also um, my first year I taught math and English, but that was into that. <laughs> but uh, in the end I was also coaching football and basketball and baseball. What attracted you to J.C. Price and what made you want to teach there? A job. A job. Yeah, at the time, I, um, I had just gotten married. I had a child and uh, was living in New Jersey, you know, and didn't have a job. So I came back to North Carolina to do my student teaching. And I did my student teaching at J.C. Price, and there was a teacher named Wilsonia Butler, who was an awesome person and an awesome teacher. And I had the privilege of being her student teacher during that period of time. And when I got through doing my student teaching, another person on staff died. And as a result of the success that I had doing my teaching, they hired me to finish the rest of that school year. And following that school year, I was hired on one-year contracts for the next uh, seven, eight years. How much guidance or supervision did you have in what you taught or how you taught it, did you follow like a typical standard course study? Uh, in the beginning we didn't, but uh, near the end there was a standard course of study that the Greensboro School System was working on. And at that time, standard courses of study were not as popular as they are today. So you pretty much taught according to what book the state adopted. And you followed the outline of the book that they used for that particular grade level. Did the curriculum change over time while you were teaching there? Not a lot. Was there a third grade when you taught at Price? Do you know when and why it was added and then removed? Uh, Price School was at first uh, an elementary school and a junior high school combination. Um, middle schools didn't come into existence in Greensboro until much later. So it was a, I believe it was third grade through ninth grade. Mm. And junior high school was the uh, seven through nine. Did you live in the Warnersville community? No. Where did you live at that time? And what was that community like? Uh, let me see, I lived, um, in two places. I lived uh, over near the uh, baseball field on Lee Street, uh, near um, Highway 29, right on that corner. And there's a baseball softball field there. So that was fun because I was real young and I could go out and play baseball and stuff like that and officiate ball games uh, during the summer, make a couple extra bucks. And then I moved to uh, King's Forest and I lived there until about, about, about three years ago. And that was a upscale community. Um, a lot of good values in the community. People in the homes, properties kept up nicely. So it was a good place to live. On one hand, what evidence did you see of the negative effects of segregation and discrimination? Well, you feel the negative effects of segregation and discrimination because you don't get the, when it was segregated, you didn't get the money, the funds, you didn't get the books. The books that we often use were books that had been used in the white high schools in the community. And the books that we had were hand-me-down books. And uh, before I left, uh, we started getting our own curriculum, with brand new books, and uh, the curriculum that you asked about earlier. But... Um, the big thing about desegregation was the fact that actually in many, many ways black kids lost out because um, there, it got to be a problem of discipline. And many white teachers were fearful of disciplining black children. 
So consequently, we just kind of took advantage of it. When you would come to J.C. Price in those days, you didn't see kids walking the halls. You didn't see kids with sunshades and shirt tails out and, and hats on in the classroom. I mean, you know, you just didn't see that. And if you did, somebody would help the guy take his hat off, like, you know, come down on top of his head and the hat would go off. So there was a lot more respect for adults and for themselves. And parents believed in the school. Right. So we didn't have adversarial relationships with parents, and we didn't have parents coming in saying, you better not hit my child, you better not touch my child, you better not discipline my child. The students understood that they were to be disciplined. The parents went to the school. The parents knew most of the teachers. So when you go home saying that the teacher did this or the teacher did that, sometimes that parent had taught, that teacher had taught the parent. So it was always a win-win situation for parents because when they sent the kids to Price, they felt that the kids were safe and that they would learn if they could and if they were willing. What were some of your memories of Price School? I remember when I first went to J.C. Price School, I was one of those kind of people that had um, certain standards. I won't say high standards, but I'll say certain standards, like for example, um, I was a strong disciplinarian. I didn't believe in people doing a lot of talking. I had played football at A&T and I was big enough and ugly enough that they <laughs> that I didn't have any challenges. Um, the, um, hmm, got away from your answer. What was the final part of your, your question? Just what were some of your memories of the prize school? Yeah, um, The, um, let's come back to that because I had a good answer and it escaped me. Okay. How would you judge the quality of education at Price when you were there? Uh, with what we had and the teachers we had, the kids, I thought the quality of education was excellent. Even though I didn't, I didn't believe it or know it at the time. But to give an example of the kind of teachers that we had at J.C. Price School, when desegregation took place and Crosstown Busing took place in 1971, about 85% of the teachers who taught at Price, and there were other black schools in the community as well, but uh, of all the schools in the city, 85 or 90 percent of the faculty at Price left J.C. Price and went into leadership positions roles of leadership uh, either in the central office or chairmanships in schools or advice for myself I became a vice principal the principal uh, worked uh, became an associate superintendent so everybody there I mean the kids had the advantage of quality teachers and people who were interested in the kids How did the education at Price compare to white schools in Greensboro? You well, know, it would be hard to make that comparison because we weren't in the white schools. You know, I can only say what, what it was like where we were. Right. And we can only assume what it was like until desegregation came along. Then I can tell you then, that's when the educational level seemed to have gone on a downward spiral rather than an upward spiral. How did the educational segregation and discrimination affect Price? It uh, affected them in that uh, it made them feel like second-class students, citizens. Uh, it uh, made them feel that they were in a hopeless vacuum, that there was no way out. Did you have much interaction with fellow white teachers in Greensboro or the district administration? I had uh, interaction with a little bit because as a teacher I didn't get that kind of interaction. When I became later assistant principal and principal I got a lot of interaction obviously but as a teacher no we didn't get that much. Occasionally there was um, a workshop of sorts that uh, black teachers might be involved with or be invited to but there was not a lot of serious uh, interaction between the staffs. As a matter of fact, uh, if you know where, you obviously know where J.C. Price is located. Yes, sir. And to give you some idea about how things were, there was a school right up the street there. Uh, and it's still there. I don't know whether it's McKeever or what it was. 
Jones. No, not Jones. Okay. Jones is an elementary school, but right there on Lee Street. If you, because uh, they changed the landscape, uh, you can see it from Freeman Mill Road. Mm -hmm. Really? And you, it's on the right hand side, I think. And J.C. Price is on the left hand side. They about maybe a tenth of a mile from each other. The old McKeever, right? Yeah. And uh, they both, you know, had the same curriculum, uh, same, you know, junior high school, mm -hmm. but one was for whites and one was for blacks. See, that was, uh, you know, that was double, double, uh, you know, a situation that did not need to exist. Uh, and of course, later years, you know, they closed McKeever. Uh, they made J.C. Price an elementary school. After in, in the seventies, and then later they decided to close J.C. Price because it was not, allegedly not cost effective. Right. Do you remember any any of the extracurricular activities at Price? For example, the sports teams, academic clubs and contests, the PTA pageant, or the band. Yeah, we had a um, we had a band that marched. We had PTA pageants, we had PTA raffles, uh, we had uh, beautiful May Days, uh, we had um, a lot of activities for the kids on the campus because once they left school, a lot of kids didn't have places to go and things to do, so J.C. Price was the, in essence, the community center, and everything evolved around J.C. Price. Later on, there were other things built in the community, but J.C. Price was always the pillar and the heartbeat of the community. That was then called, I believe, Warnersville. Mm -hmm. so. How did these extracurricular activities and academic... No, they had, before that, we getting away from that part of the we had academic, we had debating teams, and um, then of course we had all of the athletic teams. And we didn't get to play, um, compete against the white high schools until about five years, the white middle school, junior high schools until about uh, five years prior to Crosstown Busing. Up until that time, we competed against uh, Lincoln and another school, I forget what the name of it was, but we had like three games a year, or maybe four games a year. And then finally, uh, the city fathers said that all of the junior high schools would compete against each other. And then we had really a full-fledged uh, athletic program that competed across the, um, the city. How did these extracurricular activities and academic contests contribute to your students' education? It was something that the kids, um, the students recognized that they had something to do and something joyful to look forward to other than the classroom. Do you remember the school co the school code or the school song? No. It was written by um, a J.C. Price teacher named Sheldon Williams, and uh, he is still in Greensboro. What are your memories or impressions of Principal Peeler? He was an awesome man. Uh, looking back. Um, there were times that we felt as uh, teachers and uh, parents that uh, maybe he didn't do some things, but he did as much as he could under the circumstances. He, as a matter of fact, he did more than a lot of people. He, um, he was one of those people that we felt was way ahead of his time. He, uh, he was good in technology, audio visuals. Um, as a matter of fact, he wrote proposals that uh, uh, to some uh, company, and that company gave uh, uh, the overhead projectors at that time. They they were just coming into the usage. They gave the company uh, gave every school in Greensboro overhead projectors for the classrooms, and Mr. Peel got about that much press in the paper, and about five minutes recognition with the superintendent. But everybody benefited from him. So he was an awesome man. He did everything he possibly could with what he had to work with. And uh, the kids loved him, but he was very strict. Uh, the teachers loved him. And I thought it was pretty good.
What type of disciplinary standards and expect expectations did he have for his students? He expected them to have respect for each other and respect for the teachers. And that when they didn't, um, you know, you we paddled kids in those days. Do you remember his morning announcements? He no. made morning announcements. His morning announcement was, announcements were standard, like uh, in any school. Um, you know, the activities for the day, if there was anything to be, um, that needed to be known. Uh, I don't think uh, announcements can change that much over the years. Uh, principals get on and just say to the staff what they need for them to hear for that day. Right. How... Did you teach? Obviously, you taught in another school after Price. No, I didn't. You didn't. How did your teaching, or your, how did teaching at Price prepare you for your next assignment after you left? It didn't really, um, other than the fact that uh, well, it did perhaps because when I left Price, I became assistant principal at Grimsley, and I was out there for nine years as, as an assistant. And um, I left a school that had um, about 300 and some students to go to a school at that time that had 2,500 students. I left a school that had um, three buildings. The gym had just been built, Home Economics Room uh, building on the side had just been built. And um, when I went to Grimsley, they had nine buildings on campus. So, you know, it was just... Um, Grimsley was one of the largest schools in the state. As a matter of fact, we graduated that year. I think we graduated about 1,200 kids. So there was a big, big difference, and it's kind of hard to say that it prepared me for much more than being um, being able to evaluate and you know understanding the curriculum. How do you think Price School should be commemorated by Greensboro College or the city today? What should happen to the school property? That is a very difficult question because um, obviously because you guys are here, that means that there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of uh, indecisiveness or so a lot of decisions to be made. And I have not been privy to anything other than what I read in the papers. Okay. Um, hadn't really thought much about it until I started reading it in the papers. So I don't know how much... The people in the neighborhood seem to uh, remember the days. A lot of people who live there now went to school at J.C. Price. And I didn't go to school at J.C. Price. And I don't have the same kind of roots and feelings that the people who uh, live in the community have. And apparently they grow a lot deeper and a lot stronger than I'm able to articulate to you today. So if I were them, I would be very, very concerned that a building be left or something in the building or... I'm not sure. I think uh, a commemoration statue or bust of uh, Mr. Peeler mm -hmm. uh, and some, maybe some history about uh, the school itself. Uh, there was a guy named J.C. Price who also was president and founder of, a, of Livingstone College in Salisbury. Okay. And uh, I think the main thing that I would be concerned about is that uh, the history of the school. I mean, you know, its founders, why it was there, and, um, and the purpose. Right. Oh. That concludes our question session, but um, I believe we have um, through our research, one of our groups, if I brought it with me, um, found a, I think it was like a class picture. Okay. Some pictures. Did you maybe be able to tell us what some of these pictures were? This picture is Mayday, 
a part of a May Day celebration that's outside. This one is a regular class picture or either a club picture, I'm not sure. There were several clubs at the time. And this is probably a class that's being taught in the old library. What kind of classes were taught in the old library? About how the use of the library and what was expected when you came to the library. It's, it's all included in the usage. I'm not sure about this one because it seems like some sort of scaffolding. And I don't remember that. And I'm sure these pictures go back before I got there by looking at the dress and everything. J.C. Price only had uh, two principals to my knowledge. That was Mr. Peel and then the last couple of years, Mr. Swan became principal. Thank you very much. Have you talked to a person named Catherine Barber? We have not. Um, I'm not sure if the other group has. I'm not sure. I haven't looked it up. That, um, that you really do need to talk to her because she is one of the few people remaining who spent most of her career at J.C. Price. And she, we still have a group called the uh, Price Peeler Family. And uh, it's a group of teachers that's gotten together every year since integration. And of course, the ranks have gotten very slim with people having died. Do you have any way of knowing maybe how we could get in touch with her? She's in the phone book. And can you tell us her name again? Catherine Barbara. And if it's not in there listed as Catherine Barbara, it would be listed under Jimmy Barbara. But he's dead, but I don't know that. Some people don't change their names in the phone books uh -huh. when their husbands die. But he was on the city council for years. That we need to. Is there anything else you'd like to say about J.C. Price? Go, let's go back to that question. Do you remember that question? So let's come back to it. Yes. Um, what were some of your memories of Price School? I said it was at the one. Okay, anyway, yeah. Uh, the memories uh, were um, of uh, Mr. Peeler walking, Mr. Peeler and his um, uh, philosophy of schools, uh, uh, the paddlings that took place, uh, the camaraderie that the teachers had with each other. Um, there was always a closeness that uh, with the faculty that very rarely exists today in your schools. Um, the cutting edge that Mr. Peeler stayed on and insisted that we stay on. Oh, and I know what I wanted to say. It was that we, Mr. Pillow, insisted that we visit the students of every, every student in our homeroom, go to their homes. We, I mean, that was a requirement. We had to go visit them in their homes twice a year. And we had to make a report and give it to him. And that last visit, we didn't get a paycheck until it was proven that we had visited the homes. Now, what that did, and I was saying earlier, I was about to say that I had certain requirements. Uh, I required everybody to have an ink pen, and I required them to have a, um, a notebook and everything. You know, you gotta have this. If you do your, if you do your test in writing, uh, you know, you're gonna get an F because I require ink. And that was because I had not had the opportunity to know that these kids were in such disarray at home that they were fortunate to be able to come to school and do as well as they did. And that the discipline and that everything they got came from J.C. Price School. So that was, that was what happened. When I would go visit some of the homes, it was before the, what they called the, um, the Warnersville uh, Project. The, um, 
I'm sorry. Maybe I have to edit this out. I'm sorry, but the Warnersville, the Warnersville project was that all of the old houses over there, the, the, the slums, and it was a slum area. That slums had to, they were cleared out, and then the brick that you see over there now followed the slums. But when we went into those homes, sometimes there were two and three kids sleeping in the same bed. You know, the parents could could not could just couldn't do any better at that time. So it was a lot of poverty in that area. And when the kids came to school, some of them were just lucky to be in school and willing to learn. That's, those are the kinds of things that I remember about J.C. Price and why J.C. Price meant so much to the community. And some of those very same kids whose homes we visited then remember that. And they remember what J.C. Price was to them. And that's why... They're fighting so hard to keep J.C. Price uh, in some way uh, in the community with, um, well, in some commemorative form that uh, they would accept. So J.C. Price is just not mortars and bricks. The only thing that concerns me about the community is that perhaps something should have been done a long time ago as opposed to, you know, them doing it now. But be that as it may... Better late than never, and if everything is removed, then certainly nothing would be preserved. Okay. So that that's the memory that I wanted to seriously portray. All right. Yeah. So all of our questions that we have for you. Um, Anything, anything else on the, on the top of your head that you would like to share with us? If we keep talking, I may think of something in a minute. Don't you have anything? <laughs> I was just curious to know, um, when you visited the students' homes, did that reflect then on your, in the classroom with them? Did you remember how, what their home life was like and... Uh, did that affect the way yeah, you talked about it? Yeah, it did, it did. After that, because I was talking earlier about how strict I was, after that, I became more understanding and uh, more willing to work with them and the parents. And to be totally frank with you, um, some of the, from the neighborhood in which I grew up was somewhat similar, but not quite as bad as that neighborhood. And, you know, having gone to college and everything, obviously my values had changed, and I didn't realize that they had changed. And it took me a while to be able to go back to my own beginnings to know what it was like. And uh, then when I began to really uh, relate my own personal life to those of the kids that I've taught and dealt with, um, I had a great relationship. Um, I had a fantastic experience at uh, J.C. Price. I had very, very few problems with, with anybody. How many years did you say you were the principal at Grimsley High School? I was assistant prin principal for nine years. Did you go anywhere after you left Grimsley? I became principal at Lincoln and then at Peck. I retired and worked for a company in Chapel Hill recruiting teachers from all over the world. So I've had to go to 14 countries recruiting teachers to teach in the U.S. Wow. So I still broadcast football for MT, play by play. Really? I had to kick that in. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't won a game in two years, but that's okay. <laughs> hey, Greensboro College is right there with you. Last week was about our first win in a while. Yeah, y'all's former coach, he did a coaching clinic at our school about two years back. The one before the one y'all have now. One that led you to the conference champions? George Small. The big one. The, the big one? Yeah, it was George Small. Yes, Coach Small, yeah. yeah. Nice guy. Yeah. J.C. Price was, um, it was just really a, uh, like I said earlier, I guess the best way to think of it was a, it was a community center. Because that's where all of the social social activities, those kind of things started. Uh, the community used the school. And then I don't remember the year that Warnersville, Warnersville Community Center was built. But, uh, you know, maybe somewhere in your dissertation you might make a footnote 
of how it was, you know, and what it meant prior to the uh, Warnersville Community Center being built. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I started coaching that uh, athletic field out there, I was the one who designed the plan for that field mm -hmm. because it was gullies and trees and bottles and uh, a virtual dump yard down there. Right. And um, we didn't have a, a track to practice on. And so finally I was able to talk Mr. Pill into putting pressure on some of the people that he knew. And they came over and they bulldozed it and cleared some of it off. And then later on we were able to get them to come back when they built the gym and bulldoze the rest of it. So now you got a nice flat field out there. Yeah. And I feel like I'm responsible for that one. <laughs> because that's where I had to coach football. The baseball field was up on the left. It was up there by itself and it didn't really have much of an outfield. When I say on the left, I'm, I'm talking from, from the school looking over the field now. Okay. It was on the left up in that corner. And then we level all that other off. And then to have a track out there to, so that we could practice to compete with the other kids in the city. They came over one afternoon with a little, not a back or what you call it, tractor that's got the blade on the back. Right. About that wide. Front loader? No, no, front loader. I don't know. Anyway, they got that and they, 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 you know, put a big oval. Mm -hmm. They didn't even measure it. They just put a put a big oval, and they dug into it a little bit, and then they filled it in with some stuff that wasn't much. The, the grass grew up in a while, but uh, at least that's what we call our track. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it was easier to practice football. We had about a. Prior to that, we practiced on about 30 yards of uh, before the guys would run out of bounds and hurt themselves on some debris mm -hmm. or in a gully or a tree. So once the area was leveled, uh, it became a very, very attractive area back then. It's a very pretty field right now. Yep. Yeah, it's nice. No, no, I could be upset about that because that's my field. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, the, the thing of it is, for every for everything that we got at J.C. Price School, you had to fight for it through the administration. I was shocked um, when I went to Grimsley. Uh, things like paper and pencil and stuff that, that we had to buy as teachers or the students had to buy. All you had to do was ask for it at Grimsley. Yep. They had everything. I mean <laughs> everything. <laughs> I could not believe it, you know? How could you be prepared for that? Yeah. If you sneezed, they had the paper there to blow your nose. <laughs> when people at J.C. Price got stuff, we had to, we had to hoard it. When, when we had a lamp, all we had to put it in the corner somewhere and just wouldn't let nobody touch it, just parcel it out. Because we didn't know when we were ever gonna get it again. So that's why I was so shocked when I went to Grimsley. I mean, everything. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Still that way. <laughs> Let me tell you, the athletic budget at Grimsley High School at the time, Coach Bob Jamison, the man for whom the stadium was named after, he was the athletic director. He had $106,000 in the athletic department alone that he controlled. Now, was Grimsley and Page big rivals when you were there also? Uh, they were big rivals. They became big rivals. Um, and there are so many people who don't even know the story about that. Uh, it, because I wrote the handbook that Grimm's is currently used, has been revised over the years, but I had to do the research to write the hand, student handbook. And um, and so doing, I found out about the rivalry. And the rivalry started because um, Grimsley and Dudley were the only two high schools in the city. And at that time, Grimsley was called Senior High School. Greensboro Senior High. And it remained as Greensboro Senior High. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Smith was built, and it split the Dudley community, and Page was built, and it split the Grimsley community. Mm -hmm. And then the people at Page said, how dare you think that you are the Senior High School in Greensboro? We have four senior high schools, so therefore, 
you get yourself a name. <laughs> and they forced Grimsley, they forced senior high school to the Board of Education and a lot of hurt feelings to get a name. And uh, uh, what I discovered was they found out they, that they wanted to keep the G for Greensboro in that, you know, in that, like GHS, mm -hmm. you know, Greensboro High School. So the strategy was to find somebody that they could name where they could keep the G. And this man, George A. Grimsley, I think, had done, made some great contributions, but they, named, they liked him primarily because of the G. And so they maintained the GHS. And as a result of it, um, Grimsley people resented the, what Page had made them do. And the older people in Greensboro, the power brokers and people with big money, are uh, still upset. And if you ask them which school did they go to, senior high. Proudly and very bravely. Grandparents, that's what they tell me. They won't say Grimsley. They won't say Grimsley. And so that's what started the rivalry. And over the years, it has gotten exceedingly worse. But it didn't just start last year. When, when I was there, um, the Board of Education considered taking the money to give to uh, that they made, they considered just not having the game and just giving Paige 3000 and Grimsley $3,000 <laughs> and say, y'all go your separate ways, but don't play the game. Because it cost the City, of City Board of Education more money to clean up the mess because on Grimsley's campus, everything would be red. On Page's campus, everything would be blue. <laughs> and so you had to get uh, people to sandblast it off the buildings. <clears throat> and Page had a beautiful garden over there that on the, on the corner by uh, um, what, Cone Boulevard. Mm -hmm. the Grimsley guys went over there one year and took the motorbikes and rode all up to it, tore it all up. Coach James's car was painted, was blue. They painted it red. I mean, some stuff, man, it's been out there. But it's been, it's, you know, a rivalry is a rivalry, and that's, that's one of them. But that's why it all started, and so many people have no clue as to why. That's, uh, so I thought, I thought it was very interesting. Did y'all have anything happen like that with y'all's rivalries when you were at J.C. Price? No, uh, Lincoln and J.C. Price were the only two black middle schools, I mean junior high schools, and uh, they had a good rivalry, but not like that. I mean, uh, there was a guy at Lincoln named Chavis, and Mr. Peel, and they lived next door to each other, and they, they didn't like losing each other, but <laughs> they also believed in discipline. And uh, you just, uh, you know, it's just that the, the J.C. Price kids were disciplined. I mean, they were some tough kids, don't get me wrong. And they would do anything that uh, they could do to get away with. <laughs> but uh, they knew that if they did certain things, that that would be a consequence. Mm -hmm. And today, sometimes, I'm not so sure there are consequences. And the parents seem to support the behavior, black and white. I was going to ask you next, do you prefer the way it was at J.C. Price to what it is today for disciplinary measures? I don't know. I don't prefer the, I don't prefer the separation, but uh, in so many ways, I think the, the black kids lost out. But um, there are a lot of kids who have done well as a result of it. Um, there are a lot of gains that have been made. So I would certainly not advocate in any way of uh, going back to the way it was. But uh, the discipline thing is the thing that bothers me most. Because uh, one day at Grimsley, I was walking down the hall and saw a black kid in the classroom with, with a hat and sunshades. My first year, I've been there about a month as a principal coming out of the classroom as a teacher. And I said, what's that guy doing that? So I backed up to get the teacher's name to talk to her about that. And then I looked over there and there sat some more people with shades and hats on them. Went down the hall, so I put my pistol in my pocket and went about my business. You know, it was just, um, they allowed it. But that wasn't um, the way it started out. Because the black kids today is just, uh, it's just, uh, I guess, a continuation. And a lot of white kids are just as bad, but um, yeah. it's, it's not made as public as it is when a lot of black kids do stuff.
Not always, but it's the, there are some inequalities there. Linda McDougall, do you remember her? Mm -hmm. How long did she teach at uh, Rice? I'm trying to I'm trying to remember that um, it wasn't very long. No, she didn't teach at Price. She taught at Jackson. She taught at Jackson, but someone said that before Jackson, she was at Price, so she wasn't at Price. Let me put it this way: I can't remember I can't that. Remember. Okay. I honestly can't. Uh, I seem to want to say yes, but I don't think so. No. Because I remember her being a science teacher at Jackson, and then moved to the third principal, third vice principal over at Jackson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she went on to work in uh, the central office mm -hmm. from Jackson. And uh, as a matter of fact, I had lunch with her about three weeks ago. And uh, she uh, later came to Chapel Hill to work for the company that uh, I was talking about that uh, recruited teachers from all over the world. Well, from, we, we got teachers teaching in the U.S. from 48 countries, 116 only in Greensboro, well, in Gilbert County. But she just uh, stopped working for them about a month ago, two months ago. So she's back into retirement. Okay. Now, Mr. Shelton Williams. He's the one that wrote the uh, National Anthem, I mean, the Price School Song. Okay. Um, he's still living, and um, he's not doing it. I think he might be fixing musical instruments for somebody. And the yeah. next question is, was he affiliated with the band when he was at Price? Yeah, he was the band director. Okay. Yeah, he, like I said, he wrote the uh, school song. Yeah. He used to have a jazz band. Played, played in the city, played all over the state. Is he listed in the directory? Uh, the telephone directory? Mm -hmm. I really don't know. He might be. I don't, I don't know of any reason why he wouldn't be, but different strokes for different folks. <laughs> <laughs> He would be glad to talk with you as well. But I think the person that you really, really, really need to talk to is Ms. Farber. I used to go to Mr. Peeler. I was always one of those people that had questions about everything. And uh, always innovative about the stuff I wanted to do. And that was the one thing I didn't like about Mr. Peeler. I'd go to Mr. Peeler and say, Mr. Peeler, I want to do so and so. And he would say, Well, Mr. Gwynn. Have you talked to Miss Barber? Or have you talked to Miss Butler? They tried that back in 19 so and so, and it didn't work. And so I said, okay. So then the next time I'd go in there, he said, well, Mr. Gwen, set that down on paper. That was his way of saying, write it up. He said, set that down on paper. And when I set it down on paper, it didn't exactly look as good as it sounded when I was telling them about it. <laughs> and so I finally learned how to set it down on paper, which is good, because I always had stuff in my head that sounded good when you're running it around in your head. But when you set it down on paper, as Mr. Pilva said, uh, it, it didn't always come out the right way. So I learned that when I wanted to get something by Mr. Pilva, I had to set it down on paper. And you don't have it fixed right the first time. But I also learned something else too, and, and for you guys as well. Uh, when you when you say when you don't take no for an answer, I learned that if you have a passion for whatever it is, and I had a passion for something I tell you about, if you have a passion, whether somebody else has tried it or not, I mean, you can try it, and if he has a passion for what you tried and it failed, he'll make it work. But you've got to have that inner feeling, that inner passion. Um, I started the um, after-school program with kids in the community because I knew that they couldn't study at home. They didn't have electric lights and everything. And so I started, I didn't go to Mr. Pill with the program. I went to the teachers. 
And so I got the teachers who were in the various disciplines who would stay after school and let their students come back for extra help after school. And so that was kind of the forerunner of the after school programs. And so at the end of the school year, I had almost 150 kids uh, going to uh, the teachers in the afternoon. Well, that summer, Mr. Peel got the uh, program um, funded. But the next year, he put Mr. Williams in charge. <laughs> Mr. Williams was a band director. And that was not something that he was really interested in. You know, not nothing against him. It just was just... He just, uh, he wasn't even in the curriculum curriculum area at that time as such. So it, after about a month, it fizzled and it, it was never recovered. But that's why, uh, that's when I recognize if there's something that you really, really, really want to do, you can find a way to do it if you have a passion. Since you have to go, I think, do you have anything else you'd really like to say? Can't think of anything at the moment, but like I said, the more we talk, the more I get. <laughs> it's been a long time, so you guys are taxing my memory. I, I am an old guy. You can just about figure that one out. But uh, yeah, it's, um, we, we've either covered them all or we've touched them all in some way or another. But just to, to, to reemphasize what J.C. Price meant to the community before, there was a name that was given to um, the project of clearing out all of the old rundown houses in the J.C. Price community. And uh, I can't think of the name of that project. And then if you go over there, go, go over there now, you'll see a lot of, you see some individual homes, but you'll see a lot of, what do you call them, or the brick? The brick buildings? What do they call them? The Hampton Homes. Hampton Homes and uh, all the Smith, Smith, Smith homes. homes. Smith Homes. And all those kind of homes that were built after the tearing down of uh, a lot of other places. And then they came back and did the streets over and there were some homes built and refurbished and it's, uh, it became a lot more attractive. But uh, that's, that's why so many people who are there now feel the way that they feel because it was the heartbeat of the community. All right. I 